uh, your calls to him on 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. It's 115. This is LBC. Hello, my darlings. It's me, Sharon Osborne. Just like you, I hate getting a bum deal, especially when it comes to car insurance. So rather than just accept the first offer, get off your booty and check out Money Supermarket. In fact, over half of Britain could save up to £224 on their car insurance. Save money and feel epic. Britain, you're so money supermarket. 51% of consumers could save up to £224.18. Consumer Intelligence, November 2014. I'm Joanne Webb. In the LBC Travel Centre in Kent, the M26 remains closed westbound from Junction 2A at the A20 to the M25 Junction and that's because of an accident. There are delays on the approach to the closure and as a result it's much busier than usual on the M20 heading up to the M25. On the M25 on the Kent stretch, anti-clockwise queues into the Dartford Tunnel after an accident earlier. Still very busy all the way from Junction 2 at the A2. Delays on the A13 in London on the East India Dock Road heading westbound to West India Dock Road and that's because of the roadworks. The A41 in the West Midlands is closed northbound from the M5 up to the Saints Way at West Bromwich and that's because of a load of steel has fallen off the back of a lorry so much busier than usual on the approach. In Merseyside the M53 is very slow southbound heading towards Junction 3 at Woodchurch and this is because of an accident where one lane is closed. Keeping you moving your next travel update is in half an hour. This is LBC. If you're a mummy or a daddy and you smoke in the car, you probably don't know that over 80% of cigarette smoke is invisible. That means that even if you smoke out of the car window, smoke could be blowing back in and dangerous chemicals could still be getting into my lungs. Nasty stuff like carbon monoxide, arsenic and cyanide. If you could see all the poisons in your car... You wouldn't smoke. Search Smoke Free for free support. Mum! Yes! There are penguins in my room! Nobody wants to wake up to a chilly home. So if your boiler breaks down, it's good to know that British Gas Engineers are only a phone call away. And that 92% of our surveyed home care customers would recommend our services. To find out more, call 0800 009 4747 or search Home Care from British Gas. Conditions apply. WeBuyAnyCar.com now have over 700,000 happy customers, like Donald. I hate the hustle of selling my car. I hate time wasters, tyre kickers, and as for the, oh, I've just got a couple more to look at, never to be seen again lot, I really hate them. So today I sold my car to WeBuyAnyCar.com. I like them. Oh, thanks, Donald. To sell your car hassle-free, enter your reg number now at webuyanycar.com. I am the legendary horse whisperer. I can hear the innermost thoughts in any horse's mind. And I've just been chatting with Faheen about Betfair's fantastic offer on the Cheltenham Festival. What was that? Get three free bets with every winner you back at three to one or more on day one of the Cheltenham Festival. And betting with Betfair is as simple as tap, tap, boom. This is play. Betfair. Download the app today. Applies to win and win part of each way bet. Max £75 free bet to value of stake. Terms apply at betfair.com. I know. The state pension is changing. I know. How much you get will still depend on your national insurance record. And it's being made clearer to help me understand. I know. I'll be able to see how much I'm likely to receive and understand what I can do to improve my state pension. I know. If you reach state pension age on or after the 6th of April 2016, you'll be part of the new scheme. Make sure you know the facts about the new state pension. Visit gov.uk slash your state pension for more information. You can hear what I have to say on LBC. Now you can read it too. I'm Ian Dale and make sure you pick up the new series of books from LBC's presenters. In mine, find out exactly what I think about an institution close to everyone's hearts, the National Health Service. No one is prepared to think the unthinkable, say the unsayable, much less implement the doable. The NHS, things that need to be said. The new LBC book from me, Ian Dale. Pick up your copy now from Foyles Bookshops or at foyles.co.uk for the special price of just $6.99. For more details, go to lbc.co.uk. Sheila Fogarty on LBC. 
Well, we'll make sure the care minister, Norman Lamb, doesn't leave the building without a copy of Ian's book in his hand. He's already <laughs> sent it to me, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, dear, dear. No surprise there, yes, yeah. Uh, you've made friends, haven't you, since you beat him in a in a parliamentary battle? Well, I can afford to be, uh, you know, magnanimous, uh, magnanimous you on can. that, yeah. Thank you very much for coming and taking our listeners' calls on this. J- just briefly before we get to the calls, and they're, they're coming in thick and fast already, could you just respond to something that David Oliver, the president of the British Geriatrics Association, was saying just a moment ago, that uh, until we address the the fact that local government um, funding has been cut by something like 28% um, and that is inevitably having an impact on what they can spend or are choosing to spend on social care. Mm. No parties, he feels, are really talking about that ahead of the election. Mm. What what do you say to that? Well, I I found myself agreeing largely with what he was saying. First of all, it's it's important just to say that the... uh, uh, impact on social care isn't that at that level. We've transferred money across from the NHS, 1.1 billion in this financial year, for example. Uh, but nonetheless, I recognise that budgets have been very tough. And what I call for um, is a as soon as we're through the election, a non-partisan uh, commission. I want every party to sign up to this to look uh, fundamentally at the budgets for both the NHS and the care system. The danger is that political parties focus on the NHS. It's what's politically sexy. They don't talk about the impact on social care. And that's why I think a commission needs to look at both together uh, and, and needs to have that discussion with the public about some of the big choices we need to make as a society. So that's what the Lib Dems are arguing for. And I'm just desperate for the other parties to agree to come on board with this. It's what is needed. I think everybody recognises that. that. Although there does seem to be a lot of consensus, <coughs> excuse me, now that the NHS and social care in reality seems to have collided on, on when mm. it comes to elderly. Mm. There does seem to be a lot of consensus on integration of health and social care now. Well, I, th- I think there's consensus far? about the direction of travel. Mm. Um, I would want to give this quite a turbo boost. I, w- I say that by... Well, first of all, I th- we need to have a Department for Health and Care nationally. Uh, it's ridiculous that we have the money going through the Department for Com- Communities and Local Government for care and the, the NHS money going through the Department of Health. That needs to be brought together. And then in each locality, by 2009, 18, we need a single pool budget, single commissioning, end this awful silo behaviour where you have two lots of commissioners trying to coordinate with each other. That's just ridiculous how and it's a waste that, of money. How does that fit in with the Manchester example that, that we had last week? Well, it's, Man- co- it's completely along cons- those lines. No, it's completely consistent with that and uh, and I, my whole view is that you need to empower local areas to sort of take control uh, and to do what they know best. You know, the model of dictating from Whitehall, I think, has been tested to destruction and we need to think about other ways of doing things. There'll be, I'm I'm predicting, a lot of calls on the cost of care. Can I ask you, just before we go to our first caller, about two reports which came out this week, one from the UK Home Care Association and one from the Resolution Foundation, a think tank, both t- talking about slightly different angles, really, but both con- seeming to conclude that unless there is more funding for social care, the actual market, the social care market that exists, I know it's very varied, mm-hmm. but the social care market that exists will be unsustainable. Well, I was speaking at the Resolution Foundation launch yesterday and, and I found their uh, report compelling and they were arguing for care workers to receive the living wage. There's a cost involved in that. Cost is not as high as we imagine because, of course, you get increased tax receipts uh, as a result of paying people better. Critically, you and get... And they argue stability within yeah, the care system. Yeah, you get better care because people will stay in their jobs. I also want to see a better career structure so that a great care worker can think of becoming a nurse if they want to. Uh, we, we need to make it easier for people to affect that transition. I'm quite attracted by... I had a discussion with Peter Carter, the head of the Royal College of Nursing last week, who was talking to me about whether we need to re-establish something like the state enrolled nurse, something in between uh, the care worker. We've introduced a care certificate to improve the standard of training of care workers, but I think there needs to be something between that and the graduate nurse. Yes, right. there used to be a state enrolled before a state registered yes. nurse, didn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Let's take our first call from Janet in Ealing. Hi, Janet. Oh, uh, good morning, Oh, Sheila. I can't good hear you. Oh, hang on. <laughs> I, the, the I forgot to tell the minister to put his headphones on. We were so excited. <laughs> Hello, about Janet. Go well, on, Janet. I used to work in broadcasting, so you must do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got them on now. <laughs> good. Um, uh, I'm, com- I, I'm coming from the situation of having cared for my 100-year-old bedridden, demented mother at home. I do have some experience of some of these issues. And, uh, I mean, I could talk all day about this, but my main question is, with the emphasis on moving elder care from the NHS and council-run homes 
into their own homes. There is one big red warning light flashing in front of me, namely that elder care in their own homes will become out of sight, out of mind. How do you plan to ensure that elderly people on their own and with no relatives will not be out of sight, out of mind? Mm. Having watched a carer come into my mother, wipe her bottom with a wipe and then use that same wipe to wipe over her bed sore. So having someone mm. come in doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be safe. Well, uh, absolutely. And uh, you raise a completely legitimate point. Uh, I, I don't think the government can do this on their own. Uh, families clearly have a role in keeping an eye on what's going on. I recognise that many families are sort of dispersed far and wide, so it's often uh, quite difficult. Uh, and, and so I'm also arguing that uh, neighbours, uh, communities uh, need to also play a part. Uh, uh, I think ultimately, you know, the state has a critical role to play in providing high quality care but the state can't make people happy and that's about human relationships and the more we can get uh, people in their own streets to just keep an eye out for older people who may be completely alone may not see anyone from day to day and from week to week it's in those circumstances where bad things can happen but a lot of people will agree with you about the that in our individual streets and yep. whatever building we live in and all of that it's, it, it we are all each other's responsibility but 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 that's not the care quality commission is it it's not it's not an inspectorate no and so the care quality commission has a vital role we've uh, substantially improved the accountability within the system the the inspections now that the care quality commission undertakes are much tougher uh, they inspect domiciliary care in other words care at home uh, uh, as well as care within care homes uh, there will be ratings of those providers uh, and indeed they will talk to the people receiving care and their families so that they get a really clear picture uh, of the quality of that care so I, I think we have more accountability and indeed if they fall below the new fundamental standards that we've introduced there can be prosecutions of providers that's not been possible in the past so stronger accountability but also a critical role for families and communities it hasn't been possible to prosecute what an individual or or the person <laughs> employing that individual so when I came into my job in 2012, uh, I had to deal with the Winterbourne View horror. This is people with learning disability who were abused uh, in a private hospital. When I asked the question, what's happened to the company who allowed that to happen? I was told, there's nothing we can do. You have to serve a notice first. And if they comply with the notice, you can't prosecute. And I said, well, this is completely outrageous. It's got to be changed. So from April this year, there are new fundamental standards of care. If you fall below those standards and if there's harm or neglect to a, a, an individual... It's company responsibility. Company responsibility and the directors. If there is a director who's complicit, they can be prosecuted. Okay. Anna is on the line. Thank you, Janet. I hope that helped. Anna in Farnborough. Hello. Um, hello, hello, Sheila, and hello, Mr. Lamb. Um, obviously, I, I could um, ask lots of questions, but my main question is, my mother was in, care, in a care home, my father was at home, he couldn't visit her, he, he struggled, she was brain damaged, and basically I saw a lot of uh, work that was done in the care home from the staff, and obviously with my father, I used to care with him, with my brother. My question is, being a carer, as you were trying to explain, is, is a certain way, certain person has to do it. And a lot of the work they have to do, which nurses are more used to doing, mm. which is dealing with the toilet, yeah. uh, when they have uh, um, accidents in their beds and everything. And they work long hours. And I mean, I would get called from the care home, your mother has to go to hospital. They always like somebody to go to the hospital with a member of staff. They have to hang around. I, the wages, I mean, I don't know what they earn. But my question is, when I look for jobs now, most of the jobs in the papers is all they're looking for care people, care um, workers. Mm. And I just don't think a lot of people can do that kind of work. And considering all the things that you hear in the, new, in the news about how p 
pe- uh, people are uh, looked after in care homes, it is a worry. Well, you touched a moment ago on the improving that standard of care and, mm. and, and the provision for mm. the carers themselves. So elaborate a little on that, if you would. So we've introduced a new care certificate the, uh, and, and every new care worker will be expected in the first 12 weeks of their employment to achieve the care certificate, to give some assurance to families, in particular, Anna, uh, that the quality of the care is good enough. Uh, but I've also argued, as I said earlier, that there needs to be a sort of potential career path so that particularly for youngsters, um, if they're thinking of either going into Tesco's and working at the checkout till or going into care, if we can point uh, to a potential career where you can get, gain qualifications, <clears throat> potentially gain uh, an increased wage uh, and get job satisfaction from it, then it will become, I think, a more attractive profession. But I also agree with you, we need to confront the issue of very low pay. And it is, in my view, an outrage that there are still very many uh, companies uh, not paying the minimum wage uh, to care workers. And this is a criminal offence. And I've uh, made a request for the HMRC, Majesty's Revenue and Customs, to come back in to the care sector to do uh, focused work on getting to grips with these providers who are not paying the minimum wage. I've got agreement for that. It will start in April of this year. Uh, And we need to eradicate uh, uh, non-compliance with the minimum wage in this sector. But then beyond that, uh, I argue for commissioners, local authorities and providers to aim to pay the living wage because in that way I think you give people dignity, you recognise the absolute importance of this work uh, and everyone uh, benefits as a result of it. But I come back to what I said right at the start to to you, Sheila, that we need to have a fundamental uh, national discussion this year about how we ensure that we have adequate resources in both the NHS and the care system. And as a Lib Dem minister, this is my passion and I'm determined to try to secure it. Okay, thanks for now. Uh, Do keep your calls coming 0345 6060 973. You can watch our discussion uh, here on LBC on the website if you wish. 84850 is an number to text you can tweet at lbc and if you want to tweet about this the hashtag is not just a number the time is 132 Let's get the headlines from Eleanor Noakes. A mother and her girlfriend have been found guilty of killing eight-year-old Aisha Ali in East London. Polly Chowdhury and Kiki Mudder have been convicted of manslaughter. Aisha Ali was found dead at their home in Chadwell Heath with more than 40 injuries in August 2013. The family of a man who's become the first Briton to be killed while fighting IS militants in Syria say they are devastated. The Foreign Office is warning against travelling to Syria to join any side of the conflict. Police investigating the stabbing of 15-year-old old Alan Cartwright in North London have arrested three people over his murder. The teenager was stabbed in the chest as he was cycling with friends in Islington on Friday. Unions say urgent action is needed to avoid the repeat of the chaos scene at London Bridge Station last night. Police were called to deal with crowds of passengers stranded due to signalling problems and a person being hit by a train. Network Rail says it's reviewing its plans to see if lessons can be learnt. LBC weather mainly dry with bright spells for London and the South East. Highs of 10 degrees. Showers for parts of the north of England and far south as well as Northern Ireland. Dry, fine and sunny for the rest of England and Wales. Breezy with the odd light shower in Scotland. From Global Newsroom for LBC. I'm Eleanor Noakes. This is LBC. Every day, WeBuyAnyCar.com turn people into cash buyers when they change their car. Like Rich here. Do you sell your car yet? Yeah. Sold on WeBuyAnyCar.com. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, I used the money they gave me to get a great deal off the price of a new car. <sighs> Wish I'd done that. Cheers, lads. You might get a better deal too. Enter your reg number now at webuyanycar.com. To the wheelbarrow race winners and the Sunday league smashers, the chainsaw juggling champions and the sword scoffing masters, to the triathletes, the mathletes, to all of our fellow number ones, we say, boom! You did it, and so did we. O2 has been ranked number one network for customer service satisfaction by Ofcom for the sixth time in a row. O2. Be more doc. I know. The state pension is changing. I know. How much you get will still depend on your national insurance record. And it's being made clearer to help me understand. I know. I'll be able to see how much I'm likely to receive. 
and understand what I can do to improve my state pension. I know. If you reach state pension age on or after the 6th of April 2016, you'll be part of the new scheme. Make sure you know the facts about the new state pension. Visit gov.uk slash your state pension for more information. If you need a full set of teeth replacing, now there's an alternative to the discomfort of dentures or the lengthy, painful treatment of traditional implants. I'm Dr. Michael Zibitz, dental specialist at TDC Implant Centre, and our award-winning new procedure could give you a full set of beautiful fixed teeth restored in just one day. Contact us now to find out more. See smileinaday.co.uk UK or call TDC Harley Street on 0203 7334 986. It's that time of year again. Time to turn the lights down low, light the candles, and be seduced by a dazzling French model. Like the Renault Clio, with up to £1,500 deposit contribution at 6.9% APR representative during Renault Romance season. Ooh la la. 6.9% APR representative, ordered and registered by 31st of March 2015 at participating dealers only. Finance provided by Renault Finance, subject to status and over 18s. T's and C's apply. See renault.co.uk slash offers. Sheila Fogarty on LBC. Care Minister Norman Lamb is here to take your calls 0345 6060 973. We've been talking about the kinds of problems that really all of us either now or in the future might have to face when it comes to caring for, at the moment, the four million older people um, who have care needs. Um, nearly half of people who are over 65 and only a fraction of those, around 850,000 qualify for state help. Just a word on that because that changes next year doesn't it, um, when the care cap comes in. It's more complex than it sounds the care cap. I was reading about it last night and it's 70, from next year nobody will need to pay more than £72,000 for their, for their care. own care. Yeah. In theory or in well, fact? It, it's, it's based on what the council judges uh, you need to spend on your care home costs. So Obviously, if someone chooses to go into a, a, a more expensive care home and have uh, some more luxury, for example, the cost would be higher. But you, you couldn't really say whatever you spend uh, will cover it uh, because that would just advantage better off people. So the council would judge what your care package co- would cost. And on that basis, as soon as you spent up to 72000 on your care, then you start to get your care paid for. I see a whole but world I, of appeals, don't you? Well, there, there are, there is, the, of course there is the potential to challenge and we've introduced the right to, to challenge by way of an appeal. But this is the first time ever that people have been protected from catastrophic cost. So if you uh, are unlucky enough to end up with dementia, at the moment you can lose everything you've ever worked for. Uh, And I spent years arguing the case for reform of this, uh, and I'm really pleased that we've actually legislated to introduce this cap. And along with that, there will also be extra help uh, for people on modest means. At the moment, if you've got more than 23,250 in in, 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 uh, in savings, for example, you're on your own. You get no help at all from the council. We're extending that to £118,000. So most people up to that level will be able to get a contribution towards their care costs and do you think do you think as uh, you know as, as quickly as next year do you think automatically those people in the most acute situations as you described dementia and again that figure i think mm. is set to double in yep. the next 30 years um will feel a, a, the, the, the sense of relief from that financially quite quickly well, it, it's a. I think it's a real help. Uh, it, there's no panacea here, and, and I think everyone recognises that the state can't do this on its own. There has to be a sort of partnership, a collaboration between citizens and the state. But I've always felt that it's very unfair that if you spend all your money during your lifetime and end up in retirement uh, impecunious, you get help from the state. If you've been careful with your money, budgeted carefully, saved, uh, then you're excluded from support. That That's uh, wrong and it's a perverse incentive. So we should be providing some support to protect people against catastrophic loss. Mm. And, it, and incidentally, from this uh, April, uh, we introduce a right to what's called a deferred payment if you if you've got limited means and the only way you could pay for your care was to sell your house then uh, you will be able to get in effect a cheap uh, loan from the council uh, to pay your to cover your care costs without selling and, your, and house. To, without selling your but house what i noticed in the description of of, of the cat of life after the cap is that it said um, your home may be taken into account as, as an asset well 
<laughs> well, it depends on whether <clears throat> there's a, a loved one, a, a, a perhaps a spouse, or a dependent living in the house. The, the, the rules are all also quite clear. It. Yeah, okay. yeah. Karen has called from um, Havering. I always get this wrong. Havering, Havering. Karen. Havering. Like Thank you. Havering. I, for, forever. That's one of those ones I can never quite. <laughs> Hello, Karen. My head. Go ahead, Karen. Um, uh, Good afternoon, uh, Sheila. Good afternoon, Mr. Lamb. Hello. Uh, one of the things I, I'd like to ask is my mother has been um, uh, cardiovascular, dementia suffering, in a nursing home for some time. And I'm, as you're probably aware, a lot of the time they can get urinary tract infections, become dehydrated. And nursing homes cannot actually, most nursing homes can't administer IV fluids. They have to go to hospital. Now, this Christmas, as, as past Christmases, I've ended up sitting in A&E sometimes overnight for hours, waiting for uh, 24 hours of IV fluids to go into my mum so that she's got some fighting chance of being able to get through her infection. And also IV antibiotics, again, they cannot be administered in nursing homes. So I'm just wondering what you can do about pulling together some form of um, uh, collaboration, for want of a better term, between the NHS and nursing homes to see that people who are there who are poorly can still have basic nursing care um, because it was clogging up A&E. I mean, most of the people that were around my mum, most of them were on IV fluids, most had urinary tract infections. And it was very disappointing to see that a lot of those had come from care homes in the same position as my mum. And it's not because the nursing staff aren't qualified to do it. There is a regulation which states okay. they can't. But they, that's my point, really. Well, uh, Karen, <clears throat> you make the point perfectly that we need to join up uh, health and care much more effectively. My great passion has been uh, integrated care, uh, which involves uh, stopping people ending up in hospital unnecessarily, and indeed for people who are in hospital, helping them to get back home again quickly without having them caught, sort of trapped in a hospital bed for much longer than is necessary. Uh, and uh, we need to be looking at what the barriers are to that better more joined up care and it's a ridiculous situation that you describe where there's a whole load of people frail and vulnerable people in an A&E department who perhaps don't need to be there at all and if we can find ways of removing these barriers it, whether they're by way of regulation or whether it's because of a failure to share information between different organisations we can do this much better but we need to be prepared to remove barriers in that way. And, and uh, Karen's example and your reply reveals still that this nation's obsession with hospitals our yes. dependence on hospitals yes absolutely and the, the big challenge of this century really is people living with long-term chronic conditions like uh, karen's mother with dementia but often a mix of different conditions and often a, a mix of physical and mental health conditions and the way the system is designed it's not well designed for those new pressures uh, i think one of your contributors before i came on was making the point that the system's designed for people who in the past perhaps died at the age of 70 or whatever it's all changed now people living for many years with chronic conditions uh, but we need to change the way the system's designed to meet those people's needs much better it's the irony isn't it that nutrition and health care and, uh, and cleaner air and everything is making us live longer that, that they are successes yeah but they've brought with them this challenge this huge challenge haven't they they have and i think there's one thing that is terribly important to recognize uh, just maintaining life for the sake of it is not actually what most people People want. Most people want a quality of life. And what we do at the end of life, I think, is also critically important. And respecting the individual's wishes uh, about how they are treated at the end of their life and not just assuming that the maintenance of life, whatever the, the, the cost in terms of distress, uh, I don't mean the financial cost, the cost in terms of distress, maintaining life irrespective of the quality of life is no great thing but to be proud of. To be clear, you, uh, <coughs> you're not talking there, or maybe you are, about youth are you, no, 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 are you no, talking I'm not. about people saying don't resuscitate me if X happens? Whatever, Absolutely. Whatever. I mean, yeah. respecting their wishes. Yes. Uh, incidentally, I do believe uh, in the uh, case for assisted dying, the Faulkner bill that was in the uh, House of Lords. The ultimate question is, should it be the state that decides or should it be the individual? Uh, and uh, as a liberal, I believe fundamentally it should be the individual who takes control of their life. OK, Karen, thank you very much for that for that call. Re really important one, actually. Just a, seems like a small thing that for the individual having to do it, for the A&E unit having to, to take that individual and, and probably several others at the same time. It sounds like it could be avoided with just a, a little different planning. Tony and Moorgate. Hi, Tony. 
Hi, good day, Sheila, and good day, Mr. Lamb. Hello, Tony. Uh, Mr. Lamb, Mr. Lamb, the question I'd like to put to you, I was a carer for 11 years, and uh, I worked for two different councils. And when I worked for those councils, I had a good standard of income and salaries. I had job secure with uh, pensions and everything. And since your government's come into power, you've outsourced all these uh, carers that used to work in the communities or sheltered housing schemes. And once those things were outsourced, straight away the care agencies that these things were outsourced, they did away with the contracts and they brought in zero hour contracts. Now I have colleagues who used to be able to earn up to 18,000 pounds a year with overtime employed by the councils the local social services. And now these people are not guaranteed not even 20 hours a week on minimum wage. They've lost the job security, they've lost their pensions, they lost everything you have. And from my understanding, I've been a long time as a carer and I've been in situations where I have knowledge whereby the care agents are paid up to £18 an hour for a carer to go and deliver an hour's care for the client. Mm. But most of the carers now are put pressures where they're only <coughs> going to go, go for 15 minutes. And in that 15 minutes, they're getting paid six, £6.50 an hour to do two or three jobs. Where else in the past, they used to get paid about £8.50 to do an hour's work. How can that be justifiable? Well, it's, it's, it's not, Tony. <clears throat> so the first thing I would say, I, I think it's, it's really important that we recognise the incredible work of uh, care workers. I was at an award ceremony last week in my own county of Norfolk where uh, care workers were being acknowledged and applauded for the quality of the care that they were providing. That should happen in every county of our country uh, to really recognise this uh, amazing work that is done by people in often very difficult circumstances and often, as you say, on very low low pay. The truth, Tony, is that the vast amount of outsourcing was done long before 2010. Uh, this is not something that has happened since 2010. Uh, the majority of people uh, in care, in care homes and in domiciliary care were working outside local government before 2010. That, that's the true position. Uh, but of course, wherever someone works, it, I believe very strongly they should be treated with respect and paid properly. That's why I've uh, been very, very clear and unrelenting in my pursuit of employers who do not pay the national national minimum wage uh, and who don't provide proper training to their staff, don't pay, for example, for travel between... Uh, uh, bet between people's homes when they're providing care at home. So that there needs to be high standards, whoever is providing the care. Uh, final point i just make, uh, Sheila, is that in my own county of Norfolk, uh, there's a brilliant uh, organisation that's been set up by a GP surgery. It's a social enterprise. Uh, so all the money gets ploughed back into the organisation. It's providing uh, care at home in a widely dispersed rural area. Uh, and because all the money's kept within the organisation, it means they're able to pay their care workers better. They have longer continuity. People don't keep leaving. Uh, and that means better quality of care. And that's the sort of model that I, I, I'm really attracted and, by. And with pay and quality in mind, are you going to act on uh, the, the claims by the UK Home Care Association that some councils are spending almost a fiver less an hour on care than the bare minimum that's required of them. Well, my great frustration is that I've been trying to get the Care Quality Commission as an independent body to come in to look at the quality of commissioning undertaken by councils, to look at a few good councils and to look at some really bad councils and so that we learn lessons and hold these councils to account. Uh, unfortunately I can't get agreement. Uh, Eric Pickles in the Department for Communities and Local Government refuses to agree to the Care Why? Quality Commission. Why? Well it's a philosophical difference. He, I mean, and, and I think he also says until we have evidence of a problem uh, then we can't uh, bring them in. He will have to make the case for himself. My view is that we know there's a problem. We know there's in endemic uh, underpayment of the minimum wage. We know there's a problem with 15-minute visits. Let's therefore look at the link between poor commissioning and poor care standards well, and learn lessons. Well, if, if, for example, we have Knowsley Council in the Liverpool area, um, we're told by this uh, UK Home Care Association, paying just £11 an hour. Now, the, bed, the minimum that's required, and a kind of agreed minimum, I don't know whether that's a statutory agreed minimum. No, I think that's it's a view a, of that okay. organisation, uh, but, uh, but I don't necessarily disagree with is, it. It's 15 cents. So let's say, for the sake of argument, £15. Liverpool no um, Nosley is spending £11 an hour, according to the UK 
um, Home Care Association. And you have a place in Scotland uh, paying £22 an hour. It, it, I mean, it, is £11 an hour inevitably proof that the care is substandard or not? Well, I think it becomes pretty inevitable. Uh, so I went to Bradford recently and I met with a group of uh, uh, care providers. These are providers of domiciliary care. And they told me that the council purchases care on a spot basis. So it's just, this is the, this is the care that we want a company to provide. Who's prepared to pay the going, lowest going, price? Gone. And it's a sort of lowest common denominator, a race to the bottom, uh, and you get poor care as a result of that. Much better to have proper commissioning where you incentivise good behaviour to deliver great results for the people that are being looked after, better mobility, uh, maintaining their independence and so on, and reward companies that provide that quality of care. That's the way we should be doing it. I know you have said that after May you would love to carry on doing this job. Um, uh, None of us can say what's going to happen after May, but before May, will you come back? Oh, I, yeah, I'd be delighted if, if we could get the chance. And, yeah. you know, look, uh, uh, as a Lib Dem minister, I never expected to be in this job, but I've tried to do something of value while I've had the chance. Great. Thank you Thank very you. much. It's been great to, to talk to you and to take your calls as well. Thanks very much for all your calls. And uh, for those of you who didn't get through to Norman Lamb, um, hopefully he will be back and we can take your calls and carry on talking about these issues for the next few minutes as well. Many thanks to Thank Norman you. Lamb. Uh, it's one fifty one. I'm Joanne Webb. In the LBC Travel Centre in Kent, the M26 is closed westbound between junctions 2A, the A20 and the M25 junction, and that's following an accident. There are queues on the approach to the closure, but as a result, it is much busier than usual on the M20 heading into town from junction 2 at route up to the M25. The M25 